Hello, my name is Brooke Waldman, a researcher at the Carbon Leadership Forum, working in collaboration with the University of Washington for this training series. This is module two, Introduction to Life Cycle Assessment, or LCA. This is the second of five modules in this introductory level training about embodied carbon. The previous module provides foundational material that I'll reference here today. Here are this module's learning objectives. The bold items are key terms I'll introduce here today. We hope you'll become familiar with what LCA is and how it relates to embodied carbon and policy. Product LCA and project LCA, their similarities and their differences. Who uses LCA and why? LCA standards, concepts of functional unit, scope, and system boundary. Life cycle stages, different types of LCA data, and how long it takes to conduct LCAs. All right, let's talk about life cycle assessment. So the first module in the series introduced embodied carbon. Well, in order to understand and report embodied carbon, we need to calculate it. And LCA can be used to do that. LCA is the evaluation of the inputs, outputs, and potential environmental impacts of a product or project throughout its life cycle, from raw material acquisition to final disposal. So an LCA investigates a product or project, and that could be an omelet or a smartphone or a transit system. Our focus here is on buildings and infrastructure and their materials. The LCA looks at everything going in, the raw materials and energy inputs, and everything coming out, the products, the wastes, the emissions. And then LCA translates those inputs and outputs into potential environmental impacts. And importantly, those impacts are calculated and reported using standardized methods and units. So by calculating embodied carbon in standard units, LCA, LCA allows us to add together the impacts of multiple inputs and processes to calculate a product or project's total embodied carbon. It can inform design by letting us identify hotspots in a production process or building design and then weigh design alternatives. And it allows us to make apples to apples comparisons across assessments, like from one product to another or between a particular product and a policy's GWP limit. We're particularly focused on the construction sector, so we're mostly looking at LCAs of construction products, like in concrete, lumber, asphalt, or carpet, or construction projects, like a building or a roadway. In this module, we'll cover general LCA concepts that apply to both and include some examples related to each. Module three focuses on product LCA and module four focuses on project LCA. So who uses LCA and why? First, we can look at those people conducting LCAs and we can consider two main groups doing this. Manufacturers doing product LCAs and design and construction teams doing project LCAs. In both cases, they're conducting LCAs either for internal learning or for external communication or sometimes a combination of the two. And we can consider two main groups who use the LCA results that others have produced. So there's agency staff and others involved in defining policies. They're using LCA results to set GWP threshold values and to confirm that a given product or project complies with policy requirements. And for the product and project LCA teams, they're using the results of previous LCA studies to inform which ingredients or projects to choose in their own product or project. And they're using the results of upstream LCAs as data sources in their own LCA modeling. So here's an illustration of that concept of upstream and downstream LCAs. Here, the building LCA is using the results from a concrete LCA as a data source. And similarly, the concrete LCA is using results from a cement LCA for its data source and so on. So LCAs often build upon and nest within each other. Similarly, there's a web of international consensus-based standards that govern life cycle assessment procedures. And these also build upon and nest within each other. The main body that develops these standards is ISO, the International Organization for Standardization. Here I'll mention two primary standards that apply to all LCA and provide the foundation for those other more specific standards. ISO 14040 
and 14044, outline what an LCA is and how it works and provide LCA requirements like what to include and exclude, methodology rules, and how to report results, and so on. So the steps to conducting an LCA. First is defining the goal and scope. Next is data collection, creating an inventory of all the inputs and outputs. Next is selecting LCA data that provides environmental impacts for each input and output. And finally, the in inventory and impact data are combined to arrive at LCA impact results. An LCA is often iterative, where interpreting results leads to adjustments in the previous steps. So that's the overview. I'll go into these in more detail in the following slides. The first step was goal and scope. The goal is figuring out what to assess and why. Maybe it's to assess the carbon trade-offs between different structural and envelope options in your building. Or maybe it's to support an environmental product declaration. Closely tied to the goal is defining the functional unit, or sometimes the declared unit. That's the unit of analysis for which the LCA reports results. And this is key to being able to compare from one assessment to another. So maybe the unit is one cubic meter of concrete block or one square meter of office building in use for 75 years. Next is defining the system boundary, what you include in the analysis and what you exclude. Most system boundary questions are about either one, physical scope, for example, in my whole building LCA, do I include the connected parking garage? Or in my cladding product LCA, do I include the clips and fasteners used to install the product? Or two, the temporal scope, which life cycle stages to include? Construction-related LCAs account separately for different life cycle stages, discrete portions of the product or project life cycle. These are typically classified into four main stages. The product stage, everything involved to make the product. The construction stage, getting products to the site and installing them. The use stage, which includes maintenance, replacement of materials, and ongoing operations. An end-of-life stage, which includes demolition and disposal. And each of these stages are divided into more specific modules, such as A1, A2, et cetera, as shown here. Finally, module D on the right covers processes that are outside the system boundary. So the LCA standards include options for expanding the scope of the study to consider things like the potential benefit of recycling. You won't cover those advanced topics here. Two common temporal scopes for LCAs are cradle to gate, which means the asses assessment covers the product stage only, and cradle to grave, where the study looks at the whole life cycle from raw materials through the end of life. So the system boundary allows us to define what are all the relevant inputs and outputs coming through that system during its life cycle. And the next step of the LCA framework is the inventory, which is quantifying all those inputs and outputs and is really the heart of the LCA data effort. So now we're going to talk about data. An LCA's foreground or primary data is what's collected for this particular study and typically covers items within the manufacturer's or project's operational control. This generally means the types and quantities of inputs, including materials, energy, and other processes like transport and outputs including products, co-products, and wastes. An LCA's background or secondary data is the ex existing data that was collected or generated elsewhere that the person conducting this LCA is drawing upon. Background data typically provides impacts per unit quantity of the various inputs and outputs. Background data can be further classified into specific background data which is based on the actual input being used, such as the cement supplier's data in a concrete LCA, or generic and average background data, which represents typical inputs, impacts for a given input and region, such as industry average cement data used in an LCA. Generic or average background data is appropriate when the specific supplier isn't known or the specific data doesn't exist. 
Generic or average background data can be public, like data sets in the federal LCA commons or in published industry average EPDs, or private and commercial, like proprietary LCI databases. Looking back at our earlier diagram, let's focus on the building LCA for a moment. So in this assessment of the building, the foreground data includes all the quantities used in the building, how much concrete and rebar and electricity used. And then the background data provides the impacts per unit quantity of those inputs. Now I wanna stress the significance of background data. Each piece in this little simplified diagram is really made up of dozens or even hundreds of smaller pieces called unit processes in LCA. Like all the individual steps in the cement production process is not shown here. And in most LCAs, the vast majority of all the unit processes are represented by background data, not foreground data. So background data selection really matters for the reliability and comparability of LCAs. Okay, next, the foreground and background data are used together to generate LCA results. LCAs provide results for many environmental impact categories and other indicators. Our focus here is on climate change and embodied carbon. For that, we use the indicator of global warming potential or GWP. And the typical unit we use to report GWP is kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's written either as this CO2E, which is what you'll see on the slides here, or sometimes CO2EQ. So in a simplified version, LCA multiplies the quantities collected as foreground data, times the unit impacts selected as background data to generate the impacts for that given input. So let's say there's 10 cubic meters of concrete in our product, and our background data set gives us a GWP of 300 kilograms of CO2e per cubic meter of concrete. That means when we multiply those together, that the concrete contributes 3,000 kilograms CO2e to our project's embodied carbon. Then we can do that with the rest of the inputs going into the project. Notice that all those inputs on the left are in different units. You couldn't really add up quantities of concrete and electricity in a meaningful way. But on the right, the impacts are all normalized to a consistent unit, kilograms of CO2e in this case. And since they're on the same unit, you can add up the results from those individual processes to get a total result. So that is our project's total GWP value. But one more thing, remember our functional unit? In order to make meaningful comparisons, we wanna express results per functional unit. And by dividing the project by the project area or by the total quantity of product in the case of a product LCA, we arrive at the impact per functional unit. Finally, it's time to compile and interpret results. So how one does this really depends on the goal of the study. If the goal is to compare two different design options, then one would likely look at side-by-side -side comparisons. In this example, the goal might be to identify hotspots. You can see the natural gas in yellow and batch materials in blue were significant contributors to this product's GWP. So to reduce impacts, the manufacturer might target efficiency improvements to reduce natural gas consumption, or look back on the supply chain to find alternative batch materials. So how long does it take to do all of this? Well, it depends, and it's a big range. It might take several weeks or months if you're doing an LCA of a building to compile the list of materials and align that data with the building LCA software and run the model. Module four in this series describes some quicker simplified approaches. For product LCA, it may take months to compile the data and model the production process in professional LCA software. EPDs typically need 12 months of continuous production data. However, with an EPD generator tool, such as for concrete and asphalt mixtures, there's some initial setup time for a given plant, but once set up, manufacturers can generate LCAs and EPDs for any of their products in minutes. We'll discuss this more in the next module. So, key takeaways. 
LCA is a standardized method used to calculate embodied carbon. The system boundary determines what's included in the study. Foreground data is combined with background data to generate LCA results. These results are reported in terms of a functional or declared unit that allows us to compare different options. And background data is significant. There's lots of additional resources on the CLF website, including policy toolkits, research reports, ways to connect with others interested in reducing embodied carbon. In particular, related to this module, the Embodied Carbon 101 Policy Toolkit Fact Sheet provides more introductory information. And the Advancing the LCA Ecosystem Report is a deep dive on LCA and policy. Thank you for attending this module and make sure to check out the other videos in this series. Bye.